Good afternoon. My name is Ray Tsuchiyama on a beautiful blue day in Honolulu, Hawaii. And this is Think Tech Asia, a series that really links us to China, the People's Republic in the year of the rooster, with exciting topics as we move into this year. It's already March. And we have Russell Liu, my co-host and, um, uh, and, and traveler of all regions in the globe, based in Beijing for this show. He also has an innovative entrepreneur from the U.S. Uh, living and working in Beijing. And Russell will be talking to um, him throughout the show uh, with us. And we're going to be delving into uh, the upcoming uh, President Trump uh, Xi Jinping uh, meeting in Florida that's coming up very soon on the heels of uh, Secretary of State Tillerson's visit to Beijing just last week uh, where he met uh, the President uh, Xi Jinping and the Foreign Minister to have talks uh, on trade, politics, and setting the stage, setting the stage for this uh, uh, two leader uh, meeting uh, in in the near future. So, Russell, are you there in Beijing? Hi, Ray. Hi, everyone in Hawaii. Can you introduce uh, Philip and tell us what he what is he all about uh, for the show? Yes. Good morning. Um, welcome to Beijing. It's a beautiful morning in China in Beijing today. We're in Shangdi, China, in the high tech area uh, sector uh, in China. I'm really fortunate this morning that we have Phil Blue on my left. Uh, he's the U.S. executive CEO of a company called XPO Soft, a software testing company. Um, and uh, he is CEO. He has been here over 10 years. He brings a lot of expertise. So I thought it'd be great to introduce somebody who has that background who can give us a little more inside knowledge of what's happening on the ground here. Insofar, we're talking about the new President Trump, uh, his invitation to Xi Jinping, uh, who will be coming to China uh, in a month or so. And so I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Philip Liu, um, who is an executive of uh, XBO Soft. Good morning, Philip. Good morning. Good morning, Russell. Thanks for the intro. Uh, I'd like to um, ask you a couple of questions, uh, uh, Philip. Uh, could you tell me, what what does your company, XBO Soft, do here in China? What does it do? Well, we have an engineering center here in China, and we do um, software testing. It's a service that we provide to mostly U.S. companies and companies in Europe that um, develop and make software, but they don't necessarily have the time or expertise to do thorough testing. And so that's a service that we provide. Um, uh, so we don't actually make products. It's just a service. And, and Philip, I'm curious because for our audience there, in Hawaii, the U.S., um, are you operating a U.S. company here, or is it considered to be a Chinese company? It's organized in the Chinese laws. Well, I mean, we do have a U.S. company, but we have um, a Chinese company here called uh, Wolfie, which is an a wholly for enterprise, and um, so you know the rules of a Wolfie are that. Um, uh, you know, a foreigner can own a 100% of the enterprise, but um, it's classified differently, and sometimes we have different um, rules that apply to us. Sometimes they're good, and sometimes they're bad. So it's a way of, of um, doing business in China. Right. And if, if for example, a Chinese company likewise went to the U.S., they went to California. Mm -hmm. They would have to incorporate as a California company. Right. to do business in, in the U.S. Right. I presume it's the same thing. Similar, right. So, so how long has it... Oh. Oh, we just So, um, uh, we've, we've lasted longer and survived and, and prospered probably longer than most companies. Okay. And, and to our audience, um, with what's happening on the uh, present stage in the U.S., mm -hmm. President Trump has just invited uh, Xi Jinping to come to the U.S. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you tell us, uh, what are your thoughts on that? How does it affect businesses such as yours, American businesses who, which operate in China? Maybe from, well, a, from, a, a, from a business <laughs> standpoint. That's a big question. Um, you know, from, from, an, uh, from a company's standpoint in the IT uh, 
domain, um, resources and smart people uh, are always a constraint. And so, um, from our point of view, I'm always thinking about, you know, how is this going to affect uh, the graduates coming out of school and the tightness of the labor market and the competition here because we have a lot of competition, a lot of upcoming Chinese IT companies. Um, so, you know, if the talks somehow impact um, the flow of goods and services across borders, um, you know, to me there's a lot of uncertainty there as far as our customers being in the USA and wanting and being able to and wanting to buy services from us. So um, just a lot of uncertainty. And in one of the campaign promises that President Trump made and he's repeated many times mm -hmm. is to bring back the jobs home. Mm -hmm. And for example in Mexico, mm -hmm. um, President Trump is, is putting pressure on American companies to stop investing in their companies. These jobs should be in the US. Mm -hmm. So do you foresee a possible uh, change in environment here uh, where the, the president uh, uh, pushes American companies to tell them that these jobs should be back in the U.S. Could you operate in the U.S.? Well, you know, anything is possible. I mean, we could operate in the U.S., but, you know, we have to think about what that means. Um, and when I think about the USA and I think about the labor market as compared to here, you know, um, my parents are from the Bay Area in San Francisco, so I say, okay, so what if I go to San Francisco and open an office there, right? But, uh, you know, maybe our labor rate would be 10 times higher or five times higher um, in order to get the same quality of engineer. Um, now, we could do something that's called uh, nearshoring, which means um, locating an engineering center in a um, more remote location in the U.S., say Iowa or Arkansas or something like that. But then you have the, the problem with the quality of the people in terms of their education in order to do the kinds of things that we want to do. And it would be hard to find those kinds of qualified engineers in, in remote places. So we would kind of be stuck between a rock and a hard place in terms of finding the people that we need at the cost that we can provide services that our customers would be willing to pay for. Do you think the U.S. is ready to do that for many companies to uproot from China, where it's been operating many years, like yours for 10 years, and immediately go back to the U.S.? Could you survive? Could you think American business could survive? Or does that mean the death of many businesses, which add, which bring value-added services or products because just the fact that they are not in the U.S. Mm -hmm. or in China? Well, it certainly would be very hard. We'd have to reinvent ourselves and um, thinking about where we would get the uh, kinds of people that we need. Maybe we might even have to change our whole business model. I, I really don't know. It's um, not something that I... Uh, want to approach right now or even think about it just uh, would be very difficult and so really what you have is what you do here um, software testing for US and other international companies really you are make you have an export and that export really are services so would you yeah have to rise to that? that's interesting that you mentioned that yeah I mean it is an export of services and um, uh, China actually has a classification for that in terms of export company. Um, uh, we're not classified uh, purely as an export company in China. We're classified as a high-tech company. Um, but uh, if there were some kind of a blanket policy for U.S. companies uh, buying stuff uh, in China or buying stuff or services, um, it certainly would um, uh, cloud the waters for us. Um, you know, I think about, uh, you know, you mentioned, I think you mentioned um, President Trump encouraging companies to do manufacturing in the United States and the jobs and things like that. I mean, for me, I have to think about, or I think that we should think about, and Mr. Trump should think about, you know, the kinds of jobs that are going back or that he, he wants to move back. Um, you know, the kinds of jobs, uh, you know, working in factories, um, those kinds of jobs really don't exist anymore. And what will happen is if you want to pay them, the American rate, whatever that happens to be, which is much higher than where it currently is being done, that's going to force a lot of um, unforeseen uh, things happening, like mechanization and so forth. So, um, you know, it's a complicated issue. So, with, with today's technology, what I'm seeing in China, a lot of automation, 
a lot of computerization in manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So if if we're talking about forcing American companies to manufacture to return to the, mm -hmm. to the U.S., mm -hmm. um, that possibly means a lot of capital investment in the infrastructure. That's right, which may not exist, and it's going to happen at some point in time. So so do you think there's possibly a, a gap here of so many years before U.S. can actually build its manufacturing? Capacities. Yeah, well, the, the one part is building products and manufacturing and being able to uh, have that whole infrastructure that would support uh, manufacturing our own robots in the United States. When you think about all these robots, you know, where do they come from? Well, they have to have an infrastructure supporting them in terms of services and skilled people that know how to maintain these robots and develop software for these robots. So that will require a whole cycle of innovation. In far, as far as manufacturing. Now, as for our business, which is based in services, um, I think it's going to also require our whole cycle of innovation in terms of the education, um, getting people up to speed to provide these kinds of high-tech services um, is not going to be easy. And right now, you can think about it, you know, if you go to Silicon Valley and you go to any of these large IT companies, um, most of them are from abroad. So, um, well, that's one. That's interesting what you point out. One of the concerns a lot of Silicon Valley companies had with the recent presidential uh, executive order um, uh, banning travel from uh, certain countries. Many of the foreign workers, mm -hmm. uh, skilled workers, come from these countries. That's right. And so I think that we've got to take a look and understand that you cannot run away from two things: globalization and the fact that we have the internet. Knowledge is right. shared. Knowledge right. is learned not only in the U.S. but outside. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it starts uh, much earlier than uh, looking at the IT companies and the labor force in those companies. If you go to the U.S. colleges and universities and you look at all the students in computer science and engineering, they're also foreign. And whereas a lot of the, you know, I guess you could say the American-born uh, students are in the liberal arts and things like that. And um, so the ratio of... Uh, of uh, students that uh, come from abroad in the technical fields is, is higher. So what, I, what I've really seen is an, an underlying message here, that really we're really, we're, we're actually committing suicide if we start to force American companies to change their business models because they rely on a lot of expertise, skill, technology, expertise, knowledge base from people who are not in the U.S. Either you have to bring them into the U.S. Right. to work or you have to relocate outside, for right. example, China. And speaking about uh, technology, India is on the rise, so they will be on the rise, no matter what. That's right. The U.S. does. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, you bring up some important points there, and I think it's really all about, about supply and demand. You know, I mentioned earlier about how uh, the um, the prices of labor in, say, Silicon Valley are so high. Now, why are they so high? Because okay. there's not enough good engineers there to okay. to get the work done, and so they can charge a lot more. And I think I think Ray back in Hawaii um, has a uh, software technology background. And Ray, um, please feel free to ask some questions to Phil here. Well, uh, I would love to, but we're going to go into a break. And as soon as we come back from the break in a couple minutes, we'll uh, delve into this further. I've got the Beagle Sisters here with a healthy tip. We encourage you to enjoy the food you eat this holiday season and keep it local and healthy. Yeah. Eat the rainbow, eat yeah. the rainbow, and if you need any produce, come to the Red Barn on the North Shore. Aloha, my name is Joe Kent, and I'm the Vice President of Research at the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. The Grassroot Institute is a public policy think tank, and we try to build a better economy in Hawaii, and you can see us on the TV show E Hana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcasting Network every Monday at 2 o'clock. We'll see you there, and let's build a better Hawaii together. Aloha. Thank you for watching Think Tech. I'm Grace Chang, the new host for Global Connections. You can find me here live every Thursday at 1 p.m., where we'll be talking to people around the islands or visiting the islands who are connected in various aspects of global affairs. So please tune in, and aloha, and thanks for watching. We are back in Honolulu and Beijing, and we have uh, two people based in Beijing over Skype. 
uh, Russell uh, Liu and Philip Liu. And uh, Philip uh, represents a high-tech company in the B2B sphere. Am I correct? You're selling to businesses, not to consumers. That's right. And so, but you're, uh, you have a, a global customer base. Uh, can you break down the percentage? Uh, what percentage uh, US, uh, Europe, uh, Japan, China? Well, I would say 90% um, of our business is from the USA and 10% is from Europe. Okay. So what you're doing is uh, being a US company providing services in the software area to US companies but leveraging the advanced expertise in software coding in China. That's right. We're, we're leveraging the availability of uh, high-tech, smart, capable resources here. Now, uh, these engineers, how many um, are from, uh, are Chinese, from, from uh, PRC passports? How many in your, in your uh, center? Well, in our Beijing uh, office here, they're all Chinese. We have one uh, one American, wow. um, uh, but uh, primarily, you know, we're ninety nine percent Chinese here. So, uh, when you get together for software scrums and and, and quality control, is it in uh, Mandarin Chinese or English or both? It is in Chinese. Oh, um, of course, we we deal with our customers in English. Right. Right. Uh, so, so um, again, it, it sounds to me, uh, I've been in situations in Japan and, and other places where the language is, is, uh, you know, is local, and, but the uh, product is for a global um, you know, marketplace. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, it's not just language, but uh, you know, culture and the way that we work with our clients and, and so forth. So uh, it's uh, a little bit of adapting, but... Um, it's, it makes it a challenge and fun. Right. Uh, I mean, uh, software engineering is hard to begin with, <laughs> to do it in another language or culture uh, in China. But, uh, but Philip, tell us, what made it, um, uh, is the particular um, uh, engineering, uh, software engineering uh, programs in Chinese universities that really give Chinese engineers the edge and uh, the management skills, the uh, um, you know, communication skills, and, and, and collaboration skills. Th is that the total package? Well, I mean, you bring up a big, uh, a big issue, really, which is the Chinese uh, education system and university system. And as you may know, it's um, very, very competitive for students to get into a good university. Um, and when they get into a university, um, it's also very difficult, you know, lots of homework and so forth, and lots of learning. But as far as the collaboration and communication goes, we, we have to do that in terms of training them and, and working with them that, uh, you know, as you know, it's, it's not all about numbers. So there's a lot of skills that, that are needed outside of stuff that you can learn in class. That's fantastic. And, and uh, so, Russell, go ahead. So I just say, Phil, being here 10 years, you must have at least have some uh, formula that works keeping uh, your workers who are from China mm. also culturally attuned to the U.S. because it's a, you know, you're dealing with U.S. clients. So understand the U.S. culture. It's almost like a good mix of human resources. And, and you can do it in here in China, hiring Chinese workers who are actually servicing for U.S. clients. Yeah, I wouldn't... Uh, uh I'd like to think that there's a formula, Russell. Um, uh, we do like to bring our, um, I guess you could say, an American mindset and culture here for things being long-term and uh, working long-term with our employees as well as with our clients. A lot of our employees have been with us as long as the company has been here, which is very, very rare in China. Um, so we, we like to have a culture of, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of people talk about trust and culture and so forth, but I believe we really, really do it here. And that's why people stay. And you've also leveraged your business on the fact that labor cost here would be cheaper than it would be in the U.S., the operating cost. Well, um, you know, as we talked earlier in the show, the labor costs here are cheaper than, say, Silicon Valley, but probably equivalent to 
what they call nearshoring in a, in a remote town in the USA. And as I said earlier, it's just a difference in the skills that are available. Um, uh, you know, we do compete against other countries that provide software type services like India and Vietnam and so forth. And and uh, we cannot compete against them on price either because they're much much less expensive than we are. So we we compete based on value and expertise. So based on what I'm hearing, and uh, I'll throw the question out, uh, Philip, if you were there in the meeting with President Trump <laughs> and President Xi Jinping, <laughs> uh, and and you're yeah. you're trying to keep your company, uh, you know, sustained and, and profitable, and and uh, in Beijing, uh, servicing your clients. I mean, this is all about you know customer service, right? I mean, you're trying to come up with the best service for your customers. What uh -huh. would you say to both of them? What, what would you say about your experiences 10 years in China uh, based on your American you know, uh, subsidiary? Uh, is there any list of things that you would like to continue the same or anything new? Well, I mean, I would, uh, I would advise them not to do anything <laughs> too drastic and too fast. But in terms of long-term improvements uh, for both sides, um, I think China could really work on their education system in terms of um, providing engineers with more hands-on experience and teaching more soft skills, like I just mentioned. Oh. And then in the USA, uh, on that side, I think it's really also about education and, and um, creating the interest for engineering and computer science. I think a lot of students there just aren't interested in these kinds of topics which I think is a shame because it's really shaping the future um, but wouldn't you so say that about that wouldn't you say that about the US also what? wouldn't you say that the same uh, about the US which part about uh, about uh, 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 sparking uh, computer science interest and coding in children and having more students studying in college yeah, there definitely has to be some types of programs to generate that interest and generate that passion for learning about these things, and I don't think that exists right now. In the U.S. In the U.S. Hmm. Right. Because, because uh, one could make the argument, uh, you know, and I've seen it uh, in China, that it's all based on rote. It's, it's on exams, and, and that you never question your teacher, and uh, there is no spark of creativity or innovation. Uh, very difficult to learn that in, in, in uh, Chinese universities. Or is that changing? Is that changing at all? Maybe I can, I can throw <laughs> this out. Right? That's a, that's I, a big I, question. I, I that's a big question. That's a big and, and maybe I'll give this a thought to you. When you have about 100 students in your class, do you have a lot of time in class to sit down with each of them and teach them? Or you manage it by memory, test them by memory. And so I think that's a challenge. With the amount of people here, that's a challenge. And a US classic. Well, it, uh, <laughs> that's a big question. Actually, I think it's before kids even go to school in terms of uh, learning creativity. You know, they say that a, a child is formed by the time they're six years old, right? And so I think a lot of that creativity and being able to be wrong and being able to be outside playing rather than studying and learning piano or whatever. Um, I think that that has an impact on a child's creativity um, that is really unknown at this point, but I think it's, it's there. Well, I think the Chinese realize that. I, in China, there are actually tours now being set up, education tours mm -hmm. for children in kindergarten mm -hmm. to go to U.S. kindergartens to learn and socialize with other kindergarten mm -hmm. kids mm -hmm. and speak in English. Mm -hmm. So I think the Chinese do recognize that. But getting back to Ray's question about what would you say to President Trump and Xi Jinping? Mm -hmm. Are you in favor of globalization? President Trump says maybe we should back away, America should back away from globalization and we should be more isolation. Xi Jinping at the Davos conference, the major think tank conference says China is in favor of globalization. So what do you think in terms of your business experience? Globalization or isolation? Well, geez, see, you bring up some big issues there. I think that um, I think that globalization is inevitable, actually, in that um, 
you know, just it's not something that you can start and, and turn off just by uh, having some tariffs. And that um, if we do try to stop it, there will be it's kind of like stopping a you know stopping the ocean. Um, it would be very difficult, and there will be possibly some negative uh, impacts from trying to stop it. Um, I think globalization is is good overall for everyone because people it's basically trade. Right, and so we, as human, as a human civilization, um, you know, that's what our, our economy is based on: is trade. I mean, I buy something from you, and you get something, and I get something, and we don't do it involuntarily. We do it because there's something in it for me. So I think that, um, you know, I think that President Trump is not necessarily uh, considering a, as big a picture as he could in terms of, you know, why is it that people trade anyway? Right? I mean. You know, we want to, you know, Americans want to buy stuff at Walmart, okay? And so uh, if you want to take that away from them, then uh, instead of paying $10 for a broom, we're going to pay $50 for a broom. And uh, what's going to happen to the salaries because of that? You know, we certainly need more than minimum wage. Even at $20 an hour, raising the minimum wage, you're still not going to be able to afford to buy a broom. Well, um, we're coming to the end uh, of the uh, of the program. Uh, uh, Russell, uh, Liu, uh, uh, you want to say something that kind of puts it all together? Uh, uh, that uh, you, what you think will occur at the uh, meeting with Trump and uh, C uh, President Xi? Mm -hmm. thank, thank you. I think I learned a lot actually from Philip. <laughs> I learned a lot from Philip because uh, we live in interesting times. Um, we've heard a lot from the candidate Trump about. Uh, uh, China uh, being uh, a, a currency manipulator. We've heard from his advisors that uh, there should be embargo, there should be tariffs. We've heard military action. But all of a sudden, you know, maybe this is a time, it's a window of opportunity now to sit back and for everyone, including uh, President Trump, to sit with Xi Jinping to start a relationship. All right, well, well. The Russell and Philip, thank you so much for your comments all the way from uh, springtime in Beijing. This is Think Tech Asia. Thank you very much. <laughs>